Um, speaking of, why don't they just ish? I mean, why don't they just do something? I don't know. Why doesn't NASA just send some astronauts up in Blue Origins, uh, New Shepard, and Virgin really Galactic's? Know. Uh, I've been waiting you know, to hear about this. I'm curious about this. Yeah. So basically, NASA uh, laid out uh, some initial f- plans on, you know, how to be able to procure and how to use these private companies. Specifically, in this case, they're talking about Blue Origin and um, and Virgin Galactic to be able to train astronauts. Remember, like back in the day, the, the Vomit Comet, you know, that, yeah. that yeah. airplane where you'd ride and you get about, what is that, about 30 seconds of kind of okay-ish microgravity mm-hmm. experience you know and astronauts would train on that but a lot of a lot of people would question the validity like what what are they actually training in 30 seconds and then besides puking and and how to bonk your head on the ceiling when it right. yeah i don't know um but this this is outlying a way to be able to have it so nasa could send their astronauts to these companies. These companies would train them on certain things, allow them to do, you know, they've talked for a while about being able to fly payloads and stuff, but now this is even outlining how um, researchers and stuff could fly along with their payloads to be able to do things with their payloads. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so it's going to be called part of the, the suborbital crew, subsea office within NASA's commercial crew program. Um, I'm just going to read part of this. Uh, well, so now the suborbital, the subsea office with NASA's commercial crew program uh, or within NASA's commercial crew program will lay the groundwork for flying NASA personnel on commercial suborbital space transportation systems. The goal of subsea office is to perform a system qualification or a safety assessment to enable NASA astronauts, principal investigators, and other NASA personnel to take advantage of these unique capabilities. Following the qualification, NASA plans to purchase seats on commercial suborbital space transportation systems for NASA use. I just think that's super cool. Um, a, a great step forward to continue. We've seen this from this administration, from Jim Bridenstine, um, pushing really hard on, quote, you know, NASA being the first. I'm sure it's in this article somewhere. I'll bet, any, I'll bet you anything it says NASA wants to be the first of uh, one of many customers. You know, that's. Something that Brian Stein says over and over and over again. And it's it's paying off. Like, I think this is working out where if NASA's one of, you know, if NASA helps kind of get stuff off the ground and running and, and ensures that a company can invest and develop programs for this stuff, it just means that there's more potential customers later on. And now, you know, say you want to go to space with SpaceX and Axiom, you know, go up to a private space station or something, you could now go and train with Blue Origin or with Virgin Galactic before you actually go on your trip as a part of like a, a full package that, that they could be offering is like, we're going to train you and then, you know, we're going to train you here. You're going to learn how to do this. You're going to get comfortable with this. And then we're going to fly you on the real thing later on, you know? So it's just kind of stepping stones and setting up a way to be able to, I don't know. I, I just, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's cool sub- that, that, that these suborbital, um, companies that have kind of been just sort of on the fringes i don't want to say but like just not quite getting off the ground are now having like a a, a big partner to to help them to do that yeah just, suborbital means just like an airliner or is there you you because if you you can pass the carmen line but you're not orbital there is that exactly. the idea you're yeah, in space but you're not up in instead of curving Yep. Got it. Yep. Okay. So the energy level, like to go to reach space, like it's relatively easy. I mean, relatively, you know, um, it still takes rockets for the most part to really be able to put someone in space. Um, but if you just go straight up, you're just going to fall straight back down. So that's all mm-hmm. suborbital is to go orbital. You have to reach orbital velocities. You have to be going fast enough that your forward momentum is equal to the, you know, the actual pull on uh, that earth has on you. So you're constantly falling over the horizon basically. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So these are so like these my are... model Y is suborbital currently. Yes. Wait. What? <laughs> are, have you shot it into the air for some reason? Well, how about this new new Tesla Roadster will be suborbital? Yes. Unless it's on a Falcon <laughs> Heavy, like Elon's other Roadster. I jumped the other day and went suborbital. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. Strong legs. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like there's a big range of suborbital when you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but to be clear, like most of the time when someone says a suborbital flight, they're typically referring to something that gets that crosses the Kármán line, even though Virgin Galactic mm-hmm, doesn't mm-hmm. actually cross the Kármán line. They get really close, but they don't do it. How lame would that be to go on that and not get your wings? For it is a little act- point of contention. Honestly. Yeah, like it'd be kind of because I mean, what does it cost? Two hundred grand a, a trip or yep. something? I think a quarter million for about a twenty-minute flight, basically. Or yeah, and then yeah, and you know they've already got Casey Neistat lined up to be like you know to do a review of it or something. <laughs> Qantas Airlines first class, <laughs> yeah, suborbital, yeah. <laughs> But I, yeah, th- this is just good though. I, I want to see these companies succeed, and I want it to be cheaper and more readily available to be able to fly suborbital hops. I would love to see, you know, a lot of cool stuff will come out of these eventually. Um, but it's just been so slow, yeah. like so much slower than I thought. We hardly saw New Shepard fly last year at all. Yeah. We literally haven't seen it fly for eight months or something now. It's like, what is going on? I mean, I hate to talk about things that I clearly don't know about because there's, I mean, I don't there's think they're all just sitting around like, oh, y'all want to launch again in another month or so, you know, but, <laughs> but I am just like, what else is there to test? I mean, they, they've had nothing but flawless launches and they've done like 12 of them now. It's like, yeah, New Shepard has. Well, I'm know. starting to wonder now if some of this pause that we've seen from both companies has to do with this NASA program that they're actually behind the scenes been certifying certain subcomponents and doing some certification testing and, and research and engineering and having to maybe add a few more things that NASA pointed out. Because if NASA is going to fly their astronauts on these systems, you better believe they're going to be, you know, going over everything with a fine tooth comb, make sure it lives up to their high standards of safety for their, for their, their crew. And they'll be repeating, you know, NASA will boldly be going back to, I think the last time they probably flew someone suborbital really well, I guess there is Alan Shepard and, and Gus Grissom, but then I think there's like one or two more technically Air Force pilots that flew on the X-15 mm-hmm. that that reached suborbital space. But one Can step you backwards. be suborbital and orbital in the same trip? Like you're, you're currently suborbital. Oh, now you're orbital. You got both. Yeah. I mean, until you reach orbit, you are suborbital. <laughs> right. You're, I mean, that's, that's how it goes. Like up so until even... Orbital flights were sub- suborbital at one time. Yeah, even right. like the space shuttle. The space shuttle gets pretty much with that orange fuel tank, literally is almost in orbit when it lets go of the of the fuel tank. But that fuel tank's lowest point in its circle is still pretty deep in the atmosphere. So because of that, the the orange fuel tank was suborbital, and it would mm. burn up as it reentered because you know the space shuttle like at the time it lets go of the tank on one side of the planet was like. You know, on one side of the planet, the orbit, or the shuttle, and the orange tank are here. There's, we'll say, we've got props, people. <laughs> we'll say, we'll say, it's 150 miles in altitude, but the lowest point, right when those main engines cut off, was like 30 miles in altitude on the opposite side. So they'd let go of the fuel tank and they'd do a small burn with those um, orbital maneuvering thrusters, and that would make the orbiter part go into orbit, but the orange fuel tank was still suborbital, mm. like almost orbital we're talking yeah. like a tiny little of some some small engines and it put the rest of the thing into orbit but yeah you're you're suborbital until you're orbital <laughs> hey guys thanks so much for watching this clip from our show if that's just not enough for you and you want to watch the full episode you can go to olfpod.com yt and if you want more from us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll get early access to episodes. You can join our awesome community. You can actually watch us record live and get your name in the credits by going to olfpod.com slash Patreon. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Check back every Friday for new clips here and new episodes on the main channel. Thanks, everybody.